Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, Monday, February 26, 2024. What's going on? How are ya? How y'all? How, I almost said, how y'all doing? How y'all doing? How's it going out there for you, man? 29 days this February, this year. It's a leap year. It's a leap year. An extra day to pay your rent. Extra day of Black History Month. See that? Once every four years, white people, we do do something for black people. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I am back from the road. Why do they do the leap year thing? What exactly is that? Does it have to do with the fucking earth going around the sun to make it fucking line up? Does it have to do with the Greek, ancient, Roman, Chinese New Year? Is that what it has? Well, actually, you know, the, the world isn't round anymore. It's flat. You know, I'm fucking still off Instagram. I'm loving it. End of the day, I just go in. I answer my fucking DMs from friends, and then I get the fuck off it. I'm kind of lying. I will watch three or four, and I go, don't do it, don't do it, and I get off. I get off. So what have you been filling your time with, Bill? Nothing, really. <laughs> a lot of stretching. A lot of stretching. The older you get, the more stretching you have to do. Like, you ever see these fuck... There's always... Uh, once a year, for some reason, there'll be a video of some old lady that can still fucking put her legs behind her ears. And, all you know, and you look at that and you just go, God, she must have been such a whore in the 30s, Right. Now, you look at it and you get inspired. She never stopped stretching. She never stopped working out. She never stopped fucking, let's be honest, right? <laughs> you know, we don't stretch for you guys. We're doing it for ourselves. Oh, go fucking watch Barbie again. Nobody cares. Um, that's what I do. I speak for everybody when I don't give a fuck. Um... Yeah, when I was on Instagram for like two seconds or something, there was some lady on the floor. It was some Walmart video somebody sent me showing all these fucking shit shows walking into Walmart. And, uh, you know, I never know how to feel about that. Like when I see all these fucked up looking people going into Walmart, my initial feeling is, you know, how much are rich people taking that people have to live this way? Look how fucking uneducated they are and da 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 and all of that shit. And then the other side of me goes, you know, modern medicine, as great as it is, like, it keeps the weak alive. That's the dark thought. And then the overall thought that I don't understand is why God makes dumb people. I don't understand that. Why does he make dumb people that are easily misled? And then simultaneously, he makes evil people, right? You basically have the devils and then the people that listen to him. That's kind of like what you, you have. Uh, the dummies, devils and the dummies. <laughs> and everybody else is sitting in the middle like, what in the fuck is going on right now? What are people talking about? What is this direction that we're going in? I'm really trying to think of a, a time in history when just people in the middle, right? And I don't mean like like uh, centrists, as stupid-ass fucking liberals who label everything, call them. I mean like people, you know, you're on the left, but you're not crazy on the left. You know what I mean? Like I'm on the left, but I'm like, yeah, I, you want a gun. I get it. I get it. It'd be nice if you learned how to use it, you know? <laughs> I mean, this really should be, like, you should be like a borderline fucking marksman if you own a gun, shouldn't you? I mean, that's what I would think. But then I just look at it. It's like, I remember I took the motorcycle safety course. It was two fucking days. And they were like, all right, good luck. Get out there, buddy. Woo! <laughs> Keep your head on a swivel. You know what I mean? You go down. I mean, out here, because I took the gun safety, uh, whatever, what you might call it there. When I was going to buy a gun, I had to, you know, study up on some shit. I mean, it was like a 25 page pamphlet. And then you can, you can go out and buy a gun and you can fucking, <laughs> you can fucking blow somebody away if they come in your house. America, right? I mean, that's, I mean, 
Part of me was happy that it was so easy because, you know, I'm a typical human being. I don't want to think. I don't want it to be hard. Make it easy. It should it should be more difficult, I would think. You know what I mean? There's a few things. Be funny if everything was a little more difficult. You know what I mean? If you go into like Guitar Center and you want to buy an instrument and they go, God, just sing a song for me right now. Like, I don't want to do that. Come on, let's see if you can carry a tune. We're going to sell this to you. But like, if, if you're just completely fucking tone deaf, this is just a waste of wood. <laughs> Some tree died. We're not selling this to you. Okay, you, you can't, you know. The uh, sun will come out tomorrow. Get the fuck out of here. Get out of the store. All right. There's a limited amount of trees on the planet. We cannot give you a fucking acoustic guitar. Get out of here. Or an electric one or a woodwind instrument. Get the fuck out of this store. That'd be fantastic. Um, why would it be fantastic? Why would I want to make my life difficult? I'm sitting here arrogantly acting like I would pass all of these tests. Uh, these are just ideas, people. These are just ideas. Um, I was talking today as a liberal. I was on stage this weekend, right? Moderate liberal. Meaning, you know, I don't give a shit uh, about most things that psycho liberals do. Um, and I also like conservatives do not bother me at all. I like a lot of the things that they think about. But psycho conservatives... You know, when they disappear into Jesus and racism and all of that shit. You know, whenever they say that uh, the white, ma white people are the superior race, they should immediately they cut, cut to footage of people doing the tomahawk chop. White people, without, like literally. I'll, I will never get over that, being at the Super Bowl. I just really looked into that. It's like there is not a thought in their fucking head. They don't even know why they're doing it. They're just doing it because other people are doing it. <laughs> why are we doing this i don't know what does it mean i don't know it means go chiefs what does it mean in the bigger picture oh sh i don't care all right um not to say that there's not fucking mouth breathing morons in all races there are god makes a lot of fucking stupid people and uh that's why you have wars right that's what you got out there oh jesus fucking Oh, Billy, big time. Goes to three cities this weekend, and all of a sudden he thinks he understands humanity. Well, I mean, that's how it works. That is how it works, you know? Um, all right, plowing ahead here. I had, uh, th like, three of the best shows of my career this weekend. I was in Portland, Oregon, Vancouver, British Columbia, and I was in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and... Each show just kept getting better and better, and I'm getting really excited. I will, I'm not going to lie to you. I feel like I have about two hours of material right now, so I'm kind of getting lost. Like, if I do a special this year, what I'm going to put on it? And then I'm thinking, well, that's good. I got an extra hour, but it's like, well, what hour did you do the last time you went to fucking Cleveland, you know? I'll run into that because I'm a big believer in just doing the jokes that, that you're excited about. Um, and if some fall through the cracks, then that's what the fuck happens. Um, but anyway, I started the tour up in, uh, Portland, Oregon, which a lot of people make fun of that city, myself included, but this, that, that's a fucking great city. That really is a great city with a great history and all of that type of stuff and unbelievable food up there and all of these great, um, just like individual business owners up there that are, are just crushing it. And I wanted to make sure that I gave a shout out. Uh, this guy, a couple of leather places up there. I was with Dean Del Rey. So you're going to end up in some shop that makes leather. So there's a place up there called Ship John's that just makes incredible um, from hand jackets, belts. He had like a, he gave me a guitar pick holder, you know, that, Folded over and buttoned, and it was the shape of a guitar pick. You could stick like probably like you know ten picks in there, and it had a little loop on it to stick on your keychain. It's hilarious. I can barely play guitar, you know. And just think about that. If Guitar Center actually had a test, I would have been at Ship John's going like, "Well, you know what? Uh, I can't accept that. Why not? I didn't pass the test at Guitar, <laughs> at 
Guitar Center. I already know who I'm. I'm probably going to give it to somebody. I got a buddy of mine uh, who's an unbelievable guitar player. And I'm thinking, like, this is something that nobody has. And I'm not going to put a, like that on my keychain. I don't play guitar. I play drums, you know. I fuck around with the guitar. I have a good time with it, though. I've uh, been playing a lot lately. I just like, if I could just play the Malcolm shit in ACDC, I would be happy. That's my goals. Um, there's also uh, down the street, this place, Lang Langlet's Leathers, that also makes leather jackets. And I've been looking one, looking for one for my son or daughter forever. And no one makes, you know, my son's only like three and a half years old. And I walked in and there it was. And I didn't even ask the price. I'm like, I'm buying that. I want that. Can I have that? And the guy goes, yeah. I go, that's not on hold. Nope. He hooked me up with it. And um, what else? What else did I go to there? Oh, my God. One of the best drum shops in the United States. of This is all in Portland, Oregon. And then there's like a million great places to get coffee and food and all of that stuff. Listen, don't let those fucking freak show white people walking down the fucking street. You know what I mean? Where you're looking at them going like, oh, my God. You can drive right past them. You know, you don't have to get in a car and fucking drive across the country with them. I mean, that would be, oh, my God, just listening to their views. <laughs> it's like, can we talk about something else other than fucking public bathrooms? Um, anyway, uh, Revival Drum Shop. And my, uh, my great friend and uh, unbelievable teacher, Dave Elich, happened to be in town and he took me by there, and I met the owners. They were so fucking cool. And we sat down. We played some drums together. And um, it's one of those things, like, if I lived in Oregon, that's the place where I would I would go. You know, out here it's in L.A., there's a place, Pro Drum Shop, that is just, that's the place to go to out here. In Oregon, Revival Drum Shop is just fucking incredible. All these... Oh, my God. I just sat down and played them. We had a lot of Ludwigs in there. I took some videos. I, I got a selfie or whatever that I'm going to put up. Eventually going to post there. But I just had the best time. They treated me great. You know, I bought some T-shirts and, and, and some stickers for my, my kids and stuff. And uh, we had a great time. And here's the last thing. Oh, wait. I didn't even say Gaucho Steakhouse. Second time I've been there. Unbelievable steak. Cigar room in the back, you know. And as much as I say I'm not smoking, I'm what? I'm going to fucking not smoke a cigar in a steakhouse? Right? Whatever. I had one. I had one last week. Jesus Christ. Can a man fucking live here? Um, and then... Uh, so for the longest time, I've always known that the, the Portland Trailblazers in 1976 with Bill Walton, Big Red, 25 years old. He had the bandana, the long hair, clearly smoking weed, following the dead. But in the meantime, he went out and won an NBA championship, and it was all about him. They always talk about him. They always showed a picture. He was on the cover. And I'm like, wait a minute, who the fuck was on this team? So I start reading about the 1977 NBA Finals. First of all, they played... The Philadelphia 76ers with 27-year-old um, Dr. J and 20-year-old Daryl Dawkins, rest his soul, right? They had all of these stars, Caldwell Jones and all of them, and they just brought that ABA above the rim street ball to the NBA and just was literally, the ABA and all of that stuff um, is what the NBA now is Um with everybody just, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. Back in the day, you used to elevate and you dunk on somebody that was trying to fucking knee in the, in the nuts or fucking elbow you. Now, like, nobody's allowed to stand under the fucking rim and you dunk on nobody. <clears throat> and then scream like you, you, you dunked on somebody. I don't know. I don't get it. They used to dunk on people back in the day and they didn't say anything. They just dunked on you. They'd look at you. That was it. But they didn't go, Aah! whatever the fuck they do now. Now they dunk on nobody and then they scream. Are they screaming because they're lonely? Like, is it an intimidation thing or is it because there's nobody to dunk on? They feel like that chick that was in the bottom of the well that crawled out, right? Um, anyway, so I read up on this series. Um, the Philadelphia 76ers went up two games to none. All right? And in game two, which the Sixers won in Philadelphia... 20-year-old Daryl Dawkins jumped up, 
ripped down a rebound, and his, he got his arms hooked up with this guy, Bob Gross. He threw the guy to the ground. I guess the dude said something to him, and Dale ran at him and punched him, you know, in the face, gave him a quick jab, and then he backed up. You know how basketball players fight, right? They punch and fucking start fucking backpedaling down the court like they're trying to cover Randy Moss back in the day. So he starts doing that, and then Maurice Lucas, rest his soul, a.k.a. the enforcer, classic enforcer, kicked the shit out of anybody on the court, off the court, teddy bear, right? Comes flying in and just punches Daryl Dawkins right in the back of the fucking head. I can't believe he didn't knock him out. Daryl turns around, squares off, wanted no part of him. All right? The fucking... Sixers still won that game. This is why this is why it was a man's game back then. Guess who played game three? Daryl Dawkins, Bob Gross, and Maurice Lucas. <laughs> they probably finished game two. There was like, I don't know, maybe they got kicked out of that game. I don't know what happened, right? So that turned the series around, and it wasn't even the fight. It was before game three. They're back in Portland. And Maurice Lucas famously, that I kind of got, like, I never even heard about this. He walked up, and right before game three, he just walked up and shook Daryl Dawkins' hand. And it kind of diffused the whole thing. And they were like, what the fuck? They, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I, I have to go back, and I, I got to go on YouTube one night when I'm on the road. And if anybody has a link, I want to watch some of these. Like, I would love to watch whatever footage there is of the 77, 78, and 79 NBA Finals. Um, 1980, I kind of know a little bit of about. That was another time the Sixers went to the Finals. And Dr. J had that amazing jumping up in the air, went out of bounds, went underneath baseline, out of bounds, underneath, and then fucking that amazing reverse layup. Kareem was in there. I don't know who else was in there, but I think it was uh, Magic Johnson's rookie year. It was an incredible time. And then, of course, the 83 Sixers, they finally won it. And I would put the 83 Sixers up against the 96 Bulls. I would. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> amazing story. I didn't know anything about that. And uh, World Be Free was on that team, too. Um, the, the, the Portland Trailblazers, but... Uh, that's something I got to look out for. I, I need to read up on that um, again. And uh, that was just a fun time in the league. You know what I mean? Guys had fucking, you know, had the afros. The white guys had the long stoner hair. I mean, it was just fucking <laughs> that post-Vietnam fucking era in America was pretty fucking cool. Um, so anyway, the next night I go up to... Uh, Vancouver had a great show, by the way. Amazing crowd in Portland. And um, I don't know. I got to be honest with you. Reading that whole story on the 77 uh, Portland Trailblazers kind of makes me uh, like, now nah, nah, I'm like, ah, fuck, now nah, I got to kind of root for these guys, you know, unless they're playing my Celtics. But I mean, I mean, that's just a great fucking story. That's just a great story now this that would have been like oh what does it say what kind of role model are these for the kids and espn would be going on and on and on and on and on and all these fucking people on these sports talk shows would be going on and on and on and on and it's just stupid they're just trying to talk about it to get listeners and they're acting like they give a fuck they don't they actually love it who doesn't like a good fight in the middle of a fucking game to see that everybody gives a shit and then it's let them handle it themselves all these fucking suspensions by the way, did you guys see uh, my buddy texting me about that fucking fight that that six foot seven guy in the Rangers had with the other dude? That's the way fights used to be in the NHL. Just grab a shoulder and start fucking hammering. And um, I'm just I am so bad with the NHL. I'm so bad with everything now. Now that I got kids, I mean, I just I just don't have time to watch it the way I used to. I mean, I pay attention. I look at the standings and stuff, but like. I didn't know this kid was in the league, and I guess he's just beating the fuck out of people. And then the other guy, like, he got his jersey over, six foot seven, he got the jersey over his head, he got his licks in. Um, just a great fucking fight. But anyway, plowing ahead here. Um, the next day, we go up to uh, Portland, Oregon, and um, Portland, Oregon, we go up to Vancouver. 
It's all running together. Here we go to Vancouver. Vancouver is a really interesting city. You know, the outskirts of it, it's just like, it looks like some of these houses that they have out there reminds me that, you know, the beginning scene of that movie Big, when Tom Hanks is supposed to be like, the eight-year-old Tom Hanks is riding his bicycle in that fucking neighborhood. Um, how, hey, Bill, how about a movie that didn't come out fucking 15 decades ago? I'm sorry, I'm old. Um, and then you get into this city, and it's all of these glass towers. Like, Vancouver literally looks like like Godzilla should be coming out of the water and just stepping on the, uh, stepping on the buildings. But um, from what I heard, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of money, a lot of money laundering going on um, in that city, New York City. A lot of those, you know, those empty glass towers. I guess, like in Vancouver, they were saying like there was these these uh, Asian uh, businessmen or whatever, and they would come in and they, there would be like a, a new um, building going up, and they would buy like thirteen units. I don't mean like Canadians, like I heard like overseas or whatever. And they just, and then they would just wouldn't move in. So then they added like a 10% tax and they still didn't give a fuck. I don't get how like that, how you wash your money doing that. I used to look that up. Like how, I understand if you have like a legitimate business, how you can wash dirty money. Because then you just claim that you made more money than you did. You pay taxes on it. You don't give a fuck. It's illegal money anyway. And then it becomes legal money. And then you can put it in a bank. I don't get how like, you know, they talk about like uh, people are kind of thinking like some of these Meek, Meekum auction things now where these fucking trucks are going for the fucking trucks. I saw this thing out there. There was a Cadillac. They, they took a 59 Cadillac and combined the back end with a, with a Chevy Nova, a Nomad station wagon. It looks sick. And they go, it was fucking $2.1 million is what they wanted for it. It was like, what? And they go, this is a $300,000 paint job. $300,000 is what that paint job was? If I have a $300,000 paint job, I feel that if a fucking, if a dump truck backed up a whole pile of, a whole fucking load, a yard, whatever they call it, of, of gravel onto the hood. I had to be able to buff out any scratch with a dirty gym sock if I'm paying 300 grand for a paint job. What is a $300,000 paint job? How many coats is that? I, all I know is the little that I know about the low rider scene out here in L.A., is the amount of coats of paint that are put on some of those ones, you literally feel like it's water, like you can put your hand through it. And I know that that doesn't cost 300 grand. I don't know. I don't get this. I was joking with a buddy of mine. It was $2.1 million. I mean, it was fucking gorgeous. And it had like 600-something horsepower. It was a gorgeous car, but two point, it's, it's more than a Bugatti. <laughs> I was joking with a buddy of mine. I go, does it come in a stick for $1.9 million? Anyway, so we get there. And, uh, you know, it's cloudy. <clears throat> it's raining and that type of shit. And, um, you know, it sucks. Is my Bruins went there the very next night. I just missed them. And tonight, Monday night, I should say, the Bruins are in Seattle playing the Kraken. And I've never been to a game there. I think next year I'm going to go to a game I only have to, the only two last two professional sports teams I need to see a home game of is the Carolina Hurricanes and the uh, the Seattle Kraken. That's it. <clears throat> and then I'm done. I don't know what it means, but that's what I did. I started going with baseball stadium, and then I was like, I don't know if I can go to every fucking stadium. Lunatic, and that's why I have to lay off booze and cigars, because that's what I do. I like this cigar. I'm going to fucking try every cigar. Um, anyway, uh, oh, that place. First of all, shout out to the doorman who hooked me up with, with, with a Cuban cigar that was actually real. I have to confess to something. I didn't smoke it because I'd already smoked a cigar, and I put it in my, the pocket of my pea coat. It ended up breaking in half. <clears throat> and out of respect for the guy, I'm like, I got to at least smoke the back end of this thing. And I lit it. And I did what I did every time I smoke. 
I light a real Cuban cigar. I light it and I go, oh my God. And it was actually real. And I was like, fuck. And I had to throw the top half out because it was fucking mangled. So I smoked one and a half cigars. Whatever. I used to smoke seven a week. Okay. I'm down to one and a half, but I'm not smoking. I don't smoke at the house. I don't smoke in front of the kids. Hey, Bill, we don't give a fuck whether you do or not. <laughs> Stop giving us the report. I don't know. I feel like if I, if I have someone to answer to, it'll help me cut it down, even though I don't really hear from you guys because I'm talking to myself here. What exactly am I doing right now? I don't even fucking know. So anyway, I, uh, I did my show and I was fucking exhausted afterward. Amazing crowd. Canadian crowds are just great. They, you can make fun of their country or whatever. Um, as long as you make fun of America and that type of shit. And uh, that's what I like. I always like going up there and I start to make fun of America. And then when they're like, yeah, then I, co- I come at them. And then they're like, all right, all right. We've done some shit too. And um, I uh, woke up the next day and ended up walking to find this coffee shop. I always look up, you know, best coffee in whatever city. So I'm on my way over there. I walk by this World War I memorial where they did this cool thing. They had lights around it and the, the lampshades on the lights were like World War I helmets, which was really cool. And I noticed there was sort of like, uh, you know, some people, there's always people in a park that they're like, you know, they're not just fucking sitting here listening to the wind blow through the trees they kind of maybe live here i don't know but whatever every city has that so i'm walking to the coffee shop that i looked up and i realized i don't have enough time so i just say ah oh, fuck it this this coffee shop walk by coffee shop it look good I'm, I'm, I'm gonna fucking go in there i don't want to be late right to go to the airport obviously so i go in there and uh you know it passed all the tests you know it had It was putting, uh, serving the coffee, if you didn't get it to go, were in these really, you know, cool-looking mugs. There was nice little latte art. And then, like, the cappuccino only came in one size. They also made a cortado and a flat white. So I was like, all right, this place looks legit. So I order a flat white. I got a little breakfast sandwich, and I sit down. Coffee's delicious. People look cool. And all of a sudden, this Canadian dude comes walking in. He's got his bicycle. And he's like, oh, hey, do you mind if I leave my bike here inside the store? And they're all like, yeah, that's a good idea, man. It's not going to last four seconds out there. And I'm thinking like, wait a second. Am I, am I in a bad neighborhood? <laughs> I didn't even notice. I was so busy looking at my Google Maps walking over there, right? So I finished up. I had the coffee. Everything was great. And they were really nice there. And I walked out, and the second I walked out, all of a sudden, now I'm looking around, there's, like, people nodding off on heroin and shit. But, like, I walked on the other side of the street, and for some reason, they were only on one side of the street, and Dean Del Rey was telling me that he had a buddy of his that had a shop up there, and he said they made it illegal for junkies to be on certain sides of the street. And it was basically people that paid, like, high-end rent, like the, and they, they, like, abide by it. So they just fucking nod off on one side of the street. (laughs) There was a lot of them. Like, it was reminding me of when I first moved to New York. And I wouldn't go anywhere near Alphabet City or Thompson Square Park was just totally taken over by, like, homeless people, drug addicts, people just fucking just nodding off all the time. Like, there was so many comedians that did bits about, like, people nodding off on heroin. But anyway, I ended up getting... They had a great show up there. Um, You know, people were breaking my balls about being a a Vancouver fan. And this thing, I'm so, like, not paying attention to the league, I didn't even know that the Vancouver Canucks were in first place until uh, I put on TSN, their ESPN up there. And I was like, look at them. Look at them. Number one in the West. Ahead of Edmonton or whatever. I don't know what's going on out there. Got to figure Colorado's doing something, right? Um, oh, you know what I forgot to bring up? I forgot to... I had, a, uh, I had a show get added. The Greek Theater in Berkeley, California. Berkeley, California, man. I'm really psyched about this one. I don't think... I've ever done a show. Have I ever done a show out there? 
I don't think I have. I remember one time I was looking at theaters out there to possibly shoot a special, but um, on June 8th, the Greek Theater in Berkeley, California, pre-sale starts Wednesday, and all tickets are on sale Friday, March 1st. And um, I'm very excited to do that one. Uh, I mean, I'm excited to do all of these, but, like, I usually go up, I do, like, San Francisco or I do uh, San Jose. I did Fresno the last time, and that's another fun one to do. Uh, but I never get to do Berkeley, so that should be uh, a good one. So this Wednesday, that's the pre-sale, and then it goes on sale. General is this Friday, March 1st. Um, I appreciate any and all of you coming out to that show. So let me just stop babbling here. I'll get to the final one here. The final one is I end up going to um, end up going to Utah, Salt Lake City. It was Bianca Cristoval. The whole trip was me, Dean Crunt, and uh, Bianca Cristoval had like a fucking monster set in Utah. And uh, you know, I always like bringing people that are on the way up, and she's definitely somebody on the way up. And I just kind of saw her go to another gear in that one where somebody kind of yelled some shit out at her but they weren't heckling and she just handled it like it was nothing and just went right back to you know dean has all of this new stuff and um those are the kinds of people i like going out on the road with like i see them growing and having new shit and it, it keeps you you know i'm a big i you know i believe in that you know when somebody's just coming out doing the same shit every night you know, you want somebody that's growing because I feel like that shit is like it's contagious either way, good or bad, you know. So anyway, that was uh, the last show of the run. And um, <clears throat> maybe the maybe the, the best show of it. I don't know. They were all fucking great. But um, that was the biggest crowd and I was like, wow, man, people in Utah really like me. But then I was also thinking like, yeah, but everybody out here has like four or five kids. There's like a lot of people out here. <laughs> and there's some people like, you know, 10 wives and like fucking 22 kids. Um, but anyway, it was a really, uh, a really fun run. And um, I got to do so much fun stuff before the shows. The shows were great, too. And uh, I don't know. Hope Bill's going to talk a little shit here. I'm at the top of my fucking game right now. This is the best I think I've ever been. I was telling my age, I go, those might have been three of the best shows I've ever had. And um, I have all of these new ideas and stuff. I think uh, this is going to be a killer tour. And uh, I'm very thankful for that because I've been doing this shit coming up on 32 years. Jesus Christ. On March 2nd. 32 fucking years. And... Um, I feel like I'm still learning stuff and I got all this other, I'm not dried up or anything. I'm not going to lie to you. There's definitely nights where I'm just going like, I just don't want to get on this plane. <laughs> but then I do and I do the show and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. This is fucking, this is why I do it. It's fucking amazing. It's an amazing job. So anyway, enough of my babbling. I don't have any ad reads. Surprise, surprise. Um, let's see here. What do we got here? Oh, you guys wrote in. How many have I got here? I still have like another half hour in this podcast. How the hell am I going to stretch this out? How am I going to do my fucking time here? Um, I did announce my show. Oh, you know what? All right, I'm back. It's hilarious. I'm going like, no, 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 no. Can I, can I cancel that? And it fucking doesn't let me. Um, anyway, continuing on. Uh, yeah, Formula One starts up. MotoGP starts up. Next uh, next month. You know what sucks is I was going to do a gig in, in Argentina. And then the MotoGP, around a MotoGP ra GP race, and it got, it got canceled. Fucking blows. I've never been to South America, and I, and I kind of wanted to start going to uh, one foreign MotoGP race a year. You know, I got, you know, I've run out of shit to fucking sporting events to go to. And I feel like if I did that, you know, it's just those dumb things that just keep you, you excited to go out. Because I swear to God, if I only toured the United States and I just kept going to the same fucking cities and doing the same thing, because that's another thing. Like, 
a lot of this shit that I talked about that I did when I was on the road, almost all of it I've never done before in those cities. So it kind of keeps the cities new. But if I would just do the same thing every time, it just, I don't know, it becomes depressing. And then you run out of shit to say, maybe. I don't know. Um, Anyway, uh, New York Times crossword. Bill, congratulations on being included in the New York Times crossword puzzle. The clue was comedian Bill. Look at me in a smart paper. Uh, They could have also gone with Twinkle Nuts the Clown. (laughs) And I think more people would have got it. Uh, Love the podcast. Thanks for the laugh. You know what? I bet a lot of people guessed Mar. B-U-R-R-M-A-H-R. I bet a lot of people guessed Mar because uh, it is the New York Times. I would think that way more references to him have been made in that paper than myself. Um, That's pretty cool. Well, look at that. 32 years. There's my little birthday gift for my 32nd anniversary. I finally get into a newspaper that I don't understand. I don't understand any part of that paper. I remember I would try to read it. I would try to read the front section. It's just hard to jump in, you know? There's so much stuff going on. I used to read it during that whole Bosnian Serb, you know, I don't know, what, what was it branded? A war, a conflict, a genocide, whatever, all of, the th- the, all of them? I don't know. I was trying to figure out what was going on, and uh, I, I don't know. And I would just, I wish I, I wish I did that more because I actually for a minute was kind of informed, kind of understood, or at least I had New York Times spin on it. Um, well, you know, that's a bunch of fucking liberals. You should read this fucking conservative one. No spin on this one. Oh, all right. They all have spin on them. So I would read a couple articles in the front section of the paper, and my head was about to explode. So then I would go to the sports section. And even the sports section, I was just like, this is way too much writing. <laughs> I need more pictures, and I need bigger font. Um One of my regrets, one of my regrets uh, of living in New York City is that I didn't read the New York Times enough. I was definitely, I read the New York Post and the Daily News, and I would go out and I would get a bacon, egg, and cheese, and I would just fucking sit there uh, and go right to the back of the, I mean, those those papers, they're fucking rags. I mean, they're just... They're right at my intellectual level. The whole front section is just fucking gossip and fear-mongering and all of that shit. Um, what is wrong with the fucking heat in my goddamn garage? You know, I spent all of this money trying to make this thing sort of a finished fucking garage. What is going on? It was blowing out hot air. Now it's blowing out cold. I don't, I don't, I give, who gives a shit? Who gives a fuck? It just, it is what it is. You know, it's just not going to work. And it never works. It was fucking hilarious about a finished garage. You know what I mean? You, you go in there and you try to make your man cave or whatever. The, the fucking spiders and sh- the same shit that are in every garage. There's still leaves. There's still, you just can't. There's something about a garage. You just can't keep all of these creepy crawlies out of here. Put down a nice fucking rug for what? Um, anyway, let me get back to the... Uh, Oh, let's get back to this next. Well, that is awesome. And thank you to the New York Times. I'm sure you don't share a lot of my political views, so it was nice that you uh, you put me in there. All right. Oh, look at this. Oh, 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 Ozempic. Ozempic in your ass. Um, dear Billy Berlin, Berliner Mauer. I don't get that. Berliner Mauer? Do you guys know what I'm saying? Are those two words making me say something else? Like Mike, Mike Hunt? Is Mike Hunt in the parking lot? Sounds like you're saying Mike Hunt, man. Remember that from Porky's? Um, anyway, longtime listener from Germany. Oh, Billy Berlein. Und Billy Berlein in Mauer. Um, longtime listener from Germany. I wonder what that means, Berlein or Mauer. I bet there's a bunch of German people laughing right now. What is that, fucking Red Sack? Uh, Long-time listener from Germany, 
here asking for your wise old dad, dad's advice. All right. I'm not saying it's going to be right, but I am an old dad. I uh, hope you had a great time in Berlin. Oh, I definitely did. I definitely. Um, that, that, oh, anytime you get to go to another country, it's just like th- those, you don't forget those ones. You take your own country for granted. And, and then you go to other countries. You know what's great? You appreciate them. And then what ends up happening is you miss your own country. And you get home. You're like, I fucking love this place. Um, and it was cool that I went to that other place. I um, hope you had a great time in Berlin. I did. Sad, sadly, right at that point, I was in Dublin for a semester abroad, enjoying a couple of Guinnesses. God bless you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. If I ever come off the wagon, that'd be a nice one. Nice, frothy fucking... I used to say those were like an adult milkshake. Fucking love those things. Boddington's, too, was nice. Uh, so I guess I combined your heritage in some way. Well, I'm, I'm you know, yeah, you did. I'm German Irish. Uh, here is the deal. I am a type one diabetic. Basically, me that means I have, I've had it from a young age, and it doesn't stem from old age or obesity like type two diabetes usually does. Oh, I thought it was always uh, either you were born with it or obesity. Old age? Ah, fuck, I could still get it? Jesus Christ. My body slash pancreas basically just decided that the insulin-producing cells in my body are dangerous and have to be eliminated. Oh, no. I'm 29 years old, and at the height of 183 uh, centimeters, six feet, sir, and weigh 90. I got to shut this shit up. What is, what is going on with this thing? Yeah, look, let's go. Listen what it does. It fucking, you know, you set it to like 70 degrees and it feels like you're in a fucking sauna and it way overcompensates. Then it goes, oh, fuck, we got to get it back down to 70. And then the air conditioning's coming up. I think whoever installed this had a side deal with the electric company. Turns on the heat, then it turns on the AC, turns on the heat, then turns on the AC. Or you know what? I probably hit the wrong button. Um, anyway, and I, 211 pounds, six feet, 211. You're all muscle, dude. You are a fucking problem. I would not want to run into you in a dark alley, uh, which basically means I'm slightly overweight at a body mass index of 28.4. A BMI of over 30 is seen as, as definitely overweight. I do work out thrice a week. Therefore, some of my weight might not be body fat, but muscle mass, but a little belly, And booty is always there. I have been trying to lose weight since I was about 10 years old. Mind you, I had leukemia when I was five years old. And during or after chemotherapy, I was also treated with high amounts of cortisone, which caused me to become extremely hungry. I wonder why that was. I wonder what it was about cortisone that made you hungry. And And start eating like a barn thresher. All right, that's a German idiom. Well, I got to look that up. I still have these strong longings for bad food that I have to fight each time, which we all do, as you know. Uh, as you know best, guessing from your own admission on the podcast, not from, not from your looks. Yeah, but you know something? That might not be from the cortisone. The cortisone might have made you crave food, and then you made bad choices because um, you were a kid. So you might just be addicted to sugar and salt. And if he can just kind of get away from that, I don't think it's the cortisone at this point. I would guess. I mean, I would try. You know, somebody's telling me, like, you know, order, you know, a side of vegetable. And before you eat, like, the protein, eat all of the greens or something like that. And you get full. And it causes you to uh, actually start to crave vegetables which is an incredible feeling, way better than craving cookies. And um, I don't know, this time when I've been getting in shape, I haven't, I usually just become like a rail because I just do cardio, cardio, cardio. This is this time I'm doing something different where, um, you know, just eating differently and continuing to work out, making sure I, I hang on to the muscle mass. Because, you know, when we were growing up, that's, oh, you got to fucking 
go for a jog and all of that shit. And like you would just lose all your muscle mass and you drop this weight and you just become fleshy, you know, just skin and fucking bones. I don't want to do that this time. So I like the way it's 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 happening this time. So anyway, the person says, uh, where am I? Um, now I'm actually considering trying out. Oh, 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 Zempic <clears throat> as a last resort to finally get rid of my baby fat. The company that makes this is Novo Nordisk, who I have always had a good image of because they made a bunch of the diabetes needles and insulin, insulins that I have used throughout all my life. Maybe it's a bullshit drug. I should keep trying to overcome my eating habits and work out regularly, but as every part of life seems to get easier in our modern times, why can't losing weight be the same? Anyways, have a great day, you cunt. And I hope you come back to Berlin. I'm definitely going back. And, uh, so I can not go to your show again. Of course, I'm just kidding. I surely, uh, I'm, I'll surely meet my buddies in the States soon and come to one of your shows. Thanks for all your cool work. Goodbye. Um, don't you say guten tag? Guten tag is hello. Auf Wiedersehen. Um, <clears throat> well, Here's the upside about Ozempic is if it's legal in Germany, I'm more, I would be more comfortable with it. If it's legal in my country, I mean, it's just fucking, it's, it's, the, it's Hazard County here now. Like, everybody's just fucking beyond corrupt and uh, it's, the whole thing is out of control. And you really, you're on your own to try and figure it out. Um, but I would definitely try... Um, you know, considering the fa just considering that maybe you are addicted to sugar and salt and, and investing in like a nutritionist that tries to get, you know, the great thing about you is you, the, the food that you eat over there is not poison. And I really hope that my country, the fucking pieces of shit um, who turned our food into poison are not successful in getting it to all of these other countries. Um, it's really amazing if you keep up on that story. Like, there's people like, we're not taking it. And they're like, we've created a high, higher corporate global court that says you have to take it. And it's just like, well, we don't recognize that court. Go fuck yourself. Then other countries are like, all right, well, we'll take it. But we, we have to say what's in it. And they're like, no, you're not allowed to do that. It's fucking evil. So maybe where you're from, you know, I would just really recommend... A lot of vegetables and stuff like that. That has really been helping me. Um, at my age, it's really hard to, you know, try to stay in shape. But uh, I am definitely doing it, you know. I go for walks and stuff like that. And then, like, every third or fourth day, I just do a full body workout. Uh, just lifting weights, squats, all of this stuff. And I do a bunch of stretching. And, and it's that seems to be working for me. But... Um, I got a lot of empathy for you, all the stuff you've had to deal with, leukemia and now diabetes. So um, I don't know. I, I would obviously not take the advice of a fucking standard comedian. I have no medical background whatsoever. So all I'm doing is just telling you what has been working for me. So uh, good luck to you. And uh, I can't wait to go back to Berlin and uh, do a run through Germany. I fucking love it out there. Austria. Hungry. I just had such a great time. Um, I do have to get back to France and Italy. You know, my, I might just say fuck it and just fly out for a MotoGP race. Just say, I don't need a gig. Fuck it. I'm just going to go out there and do it. You know, because you know what kills me? Every year when, when Formula One is in um, Monte Carlo, just one time I want to go there and I just want to see them going through that fucking tunnel. And every year, it's, I don't know, I just forget, and it comes up, and I'm like, God damn it. Or breakfast at Wimbledon with Dick Enberg, rest his soul. I used to love that shit. I want to go to center court at some point. Um, and once again, I, I'm not doing either one of these years this year, so I might just say fuck it and take a little, bring my wife along, bring the kids, go out there. That might be a lot for the kids to kind of go out and come back. Um, I don't know, just thinking out loud. I won't do any of that shit, but it's 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 fun to do that. You know what? I'm going to fucking do that. It's just fun to say it out loud. All right. Thoughts on go bags. Dear Wilbert. I like that. Wilbert. Um, 
A Reddit post recently went viral that described the falling out between a husband and wife when the husband discovered his wife's go bag. Wow. Basically, the wife kept a bag of essentials like toiletries and some cash in case she ever needed to quickly leave her husband. The husband saw the go bag as grounds for divorce. I personally see it as a gray area. Men and people in general can go nuts. Most people on the Internet were of the opinion that the husband was only validating the wife's go bag by getting so upset about it. Thoughts? Uh, go fuck yourself cor- cordially. Um, my thoughts is the general public always sides with the female for the most part. And the genius of women is they act like that doesn't happen. Um, anytime there's a falling out in a fucking relationship, um, the guy is blamed. I mean, just look at cheating, right? If a guy cheats, it's because not only is he a piece of shit, it's because all guys are pieces of shit and pizzas of shit and we're all dogs. If a woman cheats, well, it, there's a reason. It's because of something that the guy did. And that whole thing that women aren't lustful and don't just go out and fuck around just because they want a different dick in them, right? And there's nothing more and they can just totally compartmentalize that and come back. They act like females don't have an ability to do that. Uh, which is complete bullshit. So it doesn't surprise me that in this instant, because if you flip that around and the woman found a go bag and this woman decided to get a divorce, they would say, that's such a strong, brave fucking move. He's obviously got a side piece and blah, 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 and all of that fucking shit, right? So um, all I can say is what I would do in that situation was I would be like... uh, I definitely wouldn't feel good about it. I would be like, you know, is this some childhood shit? Like, was your mother in an abusive relationship and you've carried that? She put it onto you or you witnessed it or something? Or is this something that I'm doing? Um, Or are you just not happy and you just don't have the courage to say it yet and you want to leave? But I wouldn't just say like, oh, you have a go bag? Fuck that. I'm out of here. Um, But I also think, you know, like this is just a story, right? They found this bag and and she had it and he said it was grounds for divorce and everybody's jumping to conclusions. You don't know anything that was going on in their relationship. Like what the fuck was going on in the relationship? I have no idea. Was this guy abusive? Was he not abusive? Was, you know, is she out of her fucking mind? I, I don't know. So what would I do if I found out my wife had a go bag? That would make me feel tremendously, tremendously insecure. And I would think that she was probably already fucking somebody else. To be honest, that's what I would think. I mean, uh, ladies, any ladies listen to my fucking podcast? I mean, if a guy had a go bag... Especially with like toiletries and cash in there. They would they wouldn't look at it as a go bag. They would look at it as you have a side piece that you're fucking paying, you know? And then you clean yourself, you give her the cash, you clean yourself up after you're done fucking her and you come oh you were planning on doing it. That they wouldn't look at it like you were leaving them. Um I mean that's fucking wild. Like in what instance would you want to have to leave that quick is crazy. Um, so the obvious thing that the armchair psychologists are going to say is that he's obviously abusive if she feels she has to leave uh, that quickly. And then there's the other thing is like she might be, you know, she might have got married for the wrong fucking reason. You know? And she, you know, maybe she wanted to break up with a guy and she just didn't know how to do it. And this is like her solution. And she's just like, what if I just fucking had enough money, toiletries, and I just got the fuck out. I'll get an apartment in another fucking state and I'll just grab this bag because he's going to see me packing up and I'll just get the fuck out of there. I mean, guys abandoned families. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I mean, why, why wouldn't... 
Why would this woman be above doing that? I don't fucking know. Um, that's pretty wild. You know what? I wish my fucking gorgeous wife um, was on the podcast right now. You know what? I'm, I'm going to have to have her back, man. She'll, she'll make like a, an appearance soon. We got to do something about the go bag. But this is the thing. I'm, I married somebody who has no problem telling me what they're thinking. She, if, if she was like to that point, she would just say, yeah, listen, it's not, it's not fucking working out. And she would never be like, it's not you, it's me. She would be like, it's not me, it's you. <clears throat> Which point I'd probably be like, all right, yeah, I get it. All right. All right. Bitch, virgin friend. Okay. Bill, I got a problem. One of my good mates is 25 and still a virgin. He refuses out of fear or pride or whatever to talk to or meet girls. Um, I don't think your diagnosis is right, right out of the gate. He's 25. He's still a virgin. He refuses to meet him out of fear. Yeah, maybe fear. I don't think pride. He might have got molested and doesn't like being touched or whatever. I don't know. Could be gay. I have no idea. Uh, could be asexual. Uh, we have taken him to clubs and he will sit alone unless a girl talks to him first. And even then it's like watching a 13 year old, 13 year olds, a th- wait, it's like watching 13 year olds hide a boner. <laughs> That's a hell of a reference. I don't know what that looks like. Um, he also has a stupid amount of criteria. Where the fuck do you watch 13-year-olds trying to hide a boner? It's like watching a 13-year-old try to hide a boner. That's what the fuck you were trying to say, you idiot. You made yourself sound like a fucking pedophile. You forgot try. It's like watching a 13 years old hide a boner. Oh, maybe I read it wrong. I think I read it wrong. Oh, I'm sorry, dude. I'm sorry. (laughs) That was on me. All right, this guy's all right, and I'm a moron. Sorry. Uh, he also has a stupid... Um, I can't imagine this person listening, like the, like the panic of that first 11 seconds. That's not what I meant! Um, sorry, buddy. All right. He also has a stupid amount of criteria when it comes to the ladies, such as any chick that has more than 1,000 Insta followers is a thought in his eyes, despite him having an underbite and balding. Okay, okay, I take all of this back. Fear or pride. I should have shut the fuck up. I judged you. Okay, I'm on board with you, sir. Uh, my question is, how do I get this little bitch to finally lose his V card and man the fuck up? We are thinking about taking him to a brothel and paying for him because he's a tight ass. But knowing him, he will not go in because he can't go get it for free at a club. Despite his inability to talk to women to the point, it's like an autistic kid at a rave. (laughs) All right, listen. First of all, it sounds to me like you're a great friend because you're still hanging in with this guy. All right. This is like a draft pick where you just you've invested so much fucking money in him. At some point, you just got to cut your losses and just be like, all right, we're starting over again. And uh, you got to let him go. Uh, this is not your fuck. At, at this point, you trying to help him and taking this fucking on, like he has to go touch the hot stove and just realize that he's creating his own fucking problems. He can sit there all the fuck he wants. I love him. Is he making any money? Like, how can he sit there at 25 balding and uh, be sitting there judging a woman with a thousand followers? She, she might be trying to start a business. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, I would just, this is what I would do with him. I would say, listen, man, I've been trying. I mean, how long have you been trying with this guy? Probably since he's been around 18. I'd be like, all right, man, when's it going to happen? Right. So I would just be like, listen, dude, um, I give up. We all give up. All right. It seems like you know what you're looking for and we're not going to be in the way. Don't say you give up. Just be like, you know something? I respect the fact that you seem to like know what you're looking for. So, you know, good luck with that. And why don't you get on with your fucking 25 year old life and just go have a good time? Let him post up by himself. You know why? Yeah. 
Maybe if you just fucking just let him sit there by himself and stop giving him all this attention about when is he going to lose his fucking virginity. He doesn't seem like he wants to. I don't know what he's going through. But I got to be honest with you, uh, after reading that email, I'm fed up with him. So time for a little tough love here. All right. Anyway, it says, love the podcast. We listen to it all the time. And I'm sure he will hear this too. Oh, no. You didn't tell me that part. Go fuck yourself. Unlike my mate. Um... Yeah, all right. Well, if your friend's listening to it, yeah, I mean, you, you got you, you, you got to get you got to fucking step up to the plate. Take a couple of swings. I don't you know what? I don't know what you got to do. It's not my fucking problem. But you're, I can tell you this. You're not going to solve it on the sidelines. Um, yeah. Why don't you be a less judgy, a little less judgy? You know what I mean? <laughs> From one bald guy to a balding guy. Have less judgment like you have hair. How about that? There you go. All right? And if you're upset about that, learn how to take a fucking ball breaking. Okay, that is the podcast, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed going to fucking Portland, Vancouver, and Utah, man. I just Salt Lake City. I had such a great time. And uh, I don't even know where I'm going next because I sort of live week to week. But I'm definitely looking forward to getting out there. Um, I swear to God, that fucking Salt Lake City show, I did an hour and 15 minutes. I felt like I was on stage for about 15. It flew by to the point I was like, can I get a- I'm getting off stage right now. Am I fucking these people? I looked down. No, hour and 15 minutes. Hour and 15. They were amazing. Um, all right. That is it. That is the podcast. I'll check in on you on Thursday.